Um, good afternoon again. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, the topic of today's very interesting discussion is B2B2C models in women's health. We have, I think, a very uh, insightful panel today to join me and unpack this topic for all of us. It's quite um, what well, seems to be a burning topic in the sector. Um, I'm going to introduce myself quickly. Uh, my name is Karina. I'm going to be moderating this panel today. I'm the co-founder at Femtech Lab. For those of you um, new to our community, and maybe this is your first webinar with Femtech Lab, I will just quickly introduce what Femtech Lab is. Uh, we're a global platform for innovators and disruptors in women's health. Our goal is to accelerate this amazing wave of products and um, new innovations and cutting edge founders and help them fundraise and go to market. And twice a year, we run an accelerator program in the fall and in the spring. Um, the program is supported by over a hundred of expert advisors. We have um, over 200 investment partners. Nicole over here is one of our advisors and Rick is one of our alumni, Diana as well as one of our advisors. So this is a, uh, this is really the, the, the crew straight from the accelerator uh, in front of you today. Um, the next cohort is gonna start in the spring. So um, for those of you that are interested in applying, uh, make sure you head to our website and sign up to the waiting list. So you're the first to hear when applications are open. So that's about Femtech Lab, for those of you that somehow did not know. Uh, for those of you that are new to us, welcome. Um, coming back to the topic of the session, uh, I'm gonna start by introducing the panel. Uh, first off, we have Enrique Palares from Lactab, uh, dialing in from Barcelona, right? Um, Hello, everyone. Enrique, <laughs> Enrique is um, one of the founders at Lactab. Uh, Lactab is a um, breastfeeding solution uh, for mothers. And it's actually the statistic I always mention is that Lactab is used by a quarter of all new mothers in Spain. And Enrique has I think very insightful experience uh, positioning his product directly to women, but also to employers, insurers, and lactation providers, uh, consultants. So some interesting insights I think we'll um, we'll dig into with Enrique. Um, Hope, next, hopefully. Hopefully. Um, next we have uh, Nicole Leeds, uh, CMO at Bia Fertility and ex head of partnerships and marketing at Clue. I don't think I need to tell anyone what Clue is, <laughs> but um, Nicole has been actually with Femtech Lab from I think day one, one of our very first advisors, one of our very first supporters. Um, so great to have you here, Nicole. And uh, finally, we have Dr. Diana uh, Rutar. Did I say that correctly? I did. Almost, almost. Rutka, it's fine. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Rutka. <laughs> um, Diana is a principal at Apex Ventures and um, medical deep tech investor with a PhD in medical computer science and um, experience with uh, startup operational and sales experience. And Diana and I had some interesting chats about positioning women's health products to doctors and what that means in terms of language and marketing. And so I'm really excited to unpack some of that today as well. Um, before we dive into questions, I, I just wanted to say um, again that we're going to try to be as interactive as possible. I see quite a few of you already uh, started bringing your, your names and some of your questions into the chat. Um, please do um, ping more questions, and I'm going to try to get as many of them addressed. I, I just want to make, I, we obviously have an agenda in mind, but um, there's quite a few of you here today, quite a few are early stage founders you might wanna ask something specific. And my goal is to make sure you get as much value as possible. So do, do uh, participate. Okay, so let's, let's start with the basics. Um, Nicole, I was gonna go to you first to maybe help me set the scene a little bit. Um, can you maybe just talk a little bit about how, what is a B2B2C business model? Let's just start from there. And uh, why would a startup want to explore it? Just help us set the scene. Absolutely. So if you're, um, first of all, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I was on mute earlier when you gave that lovely introduction and I wasn't fast enough. So thank you so much for having me. It's really lovely to be here and really fun to talk about one of my favorite startup, uh, favorite topics. So what is a B 
to B2C model. So you'll often, if you're an early stage founder, um, investors or people that you're pitching your business to will talk to you about what kind of business model you had. And your options generally are B2B, which means you sell your product to businesses, B2C, which is you sell it directly to consumers, um, or B2B2C, which is you sell it to a business, which sells it to a consumer. And there's a couple of different examples that I think sort of clarify this. A really common one is um, employer models, right? So if you, for example, have health insurance through your employer, then like Vitality or something like that, then basically Vitality is selling the, their product to your employer who provides it to you. And that's a B2B to C model. But Vitality also provides B to C directly. And that's when you buy your own insurance from them directly. And that sort of illustrates what that looks like. And there's a couple of different flavors, right? There's the employer model, which I mentioned. Um, insurance is a really common one. Um, if you're in health tech, you'll also see a lot of it with um, uh, products that you buy through a clinic. Um, so that could be medical devices, that could be um, creams, or you know, if you ever go to a dermatologist's office and they sell you their own special line of face products, something like that as well. I think those are the major models. Did I miss any, um, Karina, that I should have mentioned? Yeah, sounds about right. Enrique, Diana, do you have anything else to add in terms of just high level examples of models to help to set the scene? It's complicated enough, but this is, this is good. Just leave it like that, it's great. It's <laughs> fair, okay. Um, okay, uh, great. Uh, let's maybe dive into kind of one by one and talk about employers. Uh, I think that's super interesting. We have a few startups and current cohorts that are exploring this. Um, shout out to Meg from Postpartum Plan, who's in the audience. Um, let's dive into that one a little bit. And um, Enrique, I'm gonna go to you. Um, can you tell us about your experience with Lactab, positioning Lactab to employers and some of the, I guess, main lessons learned that you would wanna share with yourself back in time? Of course, um, thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, great panel. Um, I, um, I can share basically, in the employer space, probably some of the things that we have learned are very much applicable to um, not only the employer space, but other uh, B2Bs. But we have, um, I'd say, learned three major major lessons. Um, long cycles usually are long. You, you, it takes a while before you climb the ladder, who you have to talk to and make that happen, et cetera, for, for different reasons. Usually the difference in size between a corporate and uh, startup is uh, crucial, so we, you have to get used to those longer sales cycles. Um, then I'd say it's key or the importance of finding who the decision maker is in the corporate in terms of implementing your solution or trying to have that. Not so much finding the champion, which is great, and usually you start with a champion, but it has to be the champion that leads you to the decision maker. Otherwise, you might stay there for a while just telling you how great your product is, but not really getting anywhere. This, this probably can happen too. And then where we are finding out lately is that there's a, a an IT component that I call just, I, we, we call it IT readiness. It, usually you have to have some type of um, readiness in terms of the architecture of your product so that the B2B or the corporate can hook up into how are you going to deliver your services going to be through their platform, through yours, and even if it's through yours, how is the onboarding going to work? So you're going to have to have some type of IT readiness in terms of um, APIs or technical um, solution or the security of that solution that you're providing. Uh, big corporates usually have much more liabilities or are much more afraid of those liabilities, and they're going to want to make sure that you're ready to deliver whatever it is you're selling to them. So keeping an eye on that IT readiness, if you if that explains it, is, is key. So um, probably on the questions you might ask, we can go deeper into those, those three. And I don't wanna to take too much time, but from our last research specifically on those lessons that we've learned for the employer space, we, we do a yearly research at Laptop and we just published our 2021 breastfeeding report. And we know that um, from different studies, according to UNICEF, to UNICEF, for example, employers who facilitate the, their workforce measures to prolong breastfeeding um, when they return back to work 
um, from their maternity leave, it, it reduces absences associated with caring of a child, including the male parents. Uh, from about um, yeah, that has an impact of from thirty percent to thirty percent, seventy percent less absences according to to this study. So, having a clear story to pitch to those employers, why do you need me, or how can I help you, is is key. And in the case of Lactab, we've learned that more productivity, uh, being able to retain the talent because it increases um, uh, that retention of female employees, and 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 eventually. Companies who support breastfeeding programs find that an average of retention above 90%. So having clear what's your value proposition for the corporates from your from your perspective and helping them reach to that pitch that you're you're doing is, is going to be it's going to be key. Well, I think that also kind of answers a little bit question, Laura. Uh, hi Laura from when I had about um, um, when you I guess pitch to to the corporates and, and there's maybe a bit of pushback around inclusion. Um, how do you how do you convince that this actually is a benefit, um, or how do you address the fact that it's just addressing the the female and not the male workforce, and what arguments to present against that? Although you know, to me, it seems like for example, no brainer. In, but... For exactly, for example, it's, it, it is a no brainer. But for example, in this report, you can actually state that it not, this is not only for women; it actually helps uh, parents and the other part of the of the of the um, of the family to be more productive to be able to uh, take care of your child properly going back to work in a better position etc we are not finding a lot of resistance to the actual story that you're pitching them uh, the resistance comes later more on how can we implement this most of the of the initial conversations are very positive because they see the need um, to oh, we have to get better at this. We have people leaving the company because we're not providing them enough support, not only on breastfeeding, but on their maternity experience in general and, and in, the, in, the, in the woman healthcare space. So we don't fight a lot of resistance there, but when you do, um, it's basically, this is, this is not only affecting women, this is affecting all your workforce. Um, so that, that's what we found. Thank you. Yeah, super insightful. I think also your point on sales cycles, definitely for everyone to note and finding both champion and the decision maker that signs off the budget. I think that's also super important point. Um, just like a follow up on that. And then I, was, I had a follow up for Nicole as well. Who are, um, what, what, what are, I guess, the names of the stakeholders? Like, again, if you're a startup, if you want to do some cold outreach and you're like on LinkedIn, who are you searching for? Is it HR, is it head of people, diversity, inclusion? Like who is the decision maker or the champion? Who should you be targeting for this within the corporate? Maybe Nicole can know better, but in our experience, usually it goes through HR for sure. And then probably from a budget point of view, uh, head of purchases in many cases they're the one who are going to sort of like allow the that expense um, it also depends in our case if we have been if the reason why they're trying to implement this is from an hr point of view which is the, the ideal situation or if you're seen as a marketing they, they want to look good etc and then the budget's going to come from marketing and then probably going to run into problems you rather go more towards the HR inclusion unit this because people here are going to be more attached to your uh, company. They're going to, you're going to be able to retain talent. You're going to be able to provide a better workspace. You, you, in our case, it has worked better when we have uh, pitched that way than just, oh, this is just a marketing scheme. You can say that you're working with laptop, et cetera. That usually doesn't bring too much um, um, follow-up or continuance because if that is the reason why, first of all, it's not gonna um, take long before you are not that important. And second of all, you're talking to the marketing people who have a very close budget. It's probably only for this year and it's different. You, you should wanna go for HR. At least that's what we've, we've learned. Maybe Nicole and Diana have There's something different to say. I mean, I completely agree with that if your product falls within HR and employer um, employee benefits. I think it really depends on the kind of product you're trying to sell and the kind of business you're trying to sell it to. I think Enric had it completely correct. It's about having champions and it's really about having decision maker champions because there's lots of people who wanna to talk to you. 
Um, I'll be honest, I had a boss who used to refer to it as startup petting zoo, which is lots of corporates love to be part of the excitement and the aura and the rush around, you know, talking to startups, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to give you money or they're going to give you business. And I've been on both sides of that. I've been on the corporate side when I used to work for Medtronic and medical devices. And I've been on the startup side where I've pitched and spent a lot of time putting pitch decks together for corporates only to realize they didn't really have the budget approved yet. And I think that's, um, so I do advise on partnerships um, and corporate relationships for Femtech Lab. And I think that's the biggest warning that I give startups is be cautious about how much time you put into something because the person may very well think they are the decision maker, but one of the realities about being part of a corporation is you are subject to the decisions of those that are higher than you. So they may think you have the budget, they have the budget right up until the moment, the fiscal year, you know, the new numbers come out and everybody goes, oh, not this quarter, not next quarter, and maybe not this year. Um, and that's definitely happened to me. I've spent months putting together a project with one very large pharmaceutical company, only at the end of them, at the end of it to have them say, oh yeah, well, and, and if our project gets funded, we'll totally do this. And I was like, if? So I think that's a really critical question to be asking. Um, and if I could say one more thing, I think identifying that champion really depends um, on what kind of a product you're offering. So for example, if you're selling a medical device, your champion may be a certain physician or certain clinician who wants to use your product, but in the end, it's the purchasing department that's gonna buy it. So you need to nurture that relationship with the uh, clinician first to get them to ask the purchasing department to buy it. But in the end, you really need both stakeholders and knowing, you know, there's only so much you can know from the outside, but really educating yourself as much as possible asking somebody up front, you know, who are the decision makers? What are the steps? What do we need to go through? Have you done this before? Um, are you working with other startups like us? Those kinds of questions will really help you not waste too much time on somebody who may really want to deliver, but ultimately can't. Yeah, just, yeah. just one more thing about the champions, just a very tiny thing. In our case, usually the way we have um, reached or talked to big companies, big corporates for the employee benefit program, is through champions. And usually it's, it's people who have used our product because they have a big problem. They're like, oh my God, this is great. I want my company to be delivering this to everyone. And I know other people who will be using it. They're like super big fans of your product and they're like all excited and they think they can make it get to the right people. But then eventually, yeah, they, they do manage a team of 10 or, or 30 or 50 people, but they're not the decision makers. And it's really horrible because you feel really bad because you really have a good connection with that person, with that champion but she's not the one that's going to make the decision and she probably doesn't have the way. Yeah, she's going to champion inside and she's going to put you in touch with the right person. But then if that right person doesn't have the budget or doesn't see it, it's just very frustrating. And you can spend a lot of time there. That's not going to get you anywhere. It's also tough. It's not easy to want to, to, to read this. So like we say it as, as if like people have their like a flag saying, I'm the champion, I'm the decision maker. It's not how it works. You have to figure it out. But yeah, what you said, um, uh, Nicole, on the questions, have you worked with other startups before? Do you have a budget for the, this type of questions? That make, make sense. Yeah, and uh, I would just like to echo that, what Nicole and uh, Enric already said. So I worked in my past a lot with pharma companies as well and trying to sell novel technologies. And what's really important while we're speaking here to um, B2B as well as B2C is to understand the difference in terms of sales as well as marketing and to understand that um, we have to engage champions or also so-called key opinion leaders, KOLs, medical people who are the ones who have their opinion and these opinion matter to big companies, but also to consumers. And I always think it's a really strategic approach that's needed. So on the one side, we need to engage them. We need to um, nurture them, educate them and get them as becoming champions. But on the other side, exactly as Nicole said, it's always important to understand who is signing it off. And then when you sign with a big, um, for example, pharma company, to understand what are the organizational structures, what are the procedures, and for example, to understand, um, do we need a purchase order? Who can sign this off? And 
in my experience, what is really important is to um, have these questions very early on. And if you speak to someone, especially I'm a scientist, and in my experience, I could very easily speak to scientists and get the champions. And we had great conversations, but it's a waste of time because you need to ask who can sign this off very early to not waste time. And if they tell you this person can sign it off, then you want to speak to this person. And sometimes because we're coming from scientific background or from technology background, this can be a bit more challenging because it's really getting into sales. But this is really where the focus should be at much more than, than engaging the champion because that's someone you already won. I think that's so, uh, thank you, Dan. I think that's so interesting that as soon as like, Inevitably, when you talk about B2B2C, the conversation starts going from kind of strategizing what are the different routes to sales, like as a general topic and doing sales and moving a conversation forward. And we actually did a, did a workshop with, with Katya a few weeks ago with the cohorts in this, and that um, it's easy to be in the place where you're having conversations and everyone is excited and there's all this potential and it can be hard to ask difficult questions. So if you, if you are doing B2B, in one shape or form and you're doing sales, sales is psychology and asking difficult questions, you're gonna have to do it. Otherwise you, your cycles are gonna be long and you potentially are, are not gonna get to closing because you're talking to the wrong people because you didn't ask the awkward question of, is there a budget or can you even sign this off? I think that's super key is to, to be quite blunt um, often. So it's very interesting that we end up talking about psychology of sales often. There's an awesome question that came through in the Q&A that I would love to ask. Um, so if you are a startup that has a B2C model and also is, is doing B2B2C, um, is it kind of a good idea to do both at the same time? And how do you see, I guess, like which way should you go? Where should you invest uh, your time and energy and resources? Where can you have better ROI? Which one should you focus on? Any views on that? I know Maybe. this one, I, I know this one. <laughs> okay, so you go ahead. In our case, it wasn't until we had a B2C that we could start selling to the B2B. Um, corporates would say, you guys are awesome. The product looks great. You have so much traction and all this looks good. We want to have this. How much is this? Um, and we would be, well, it's currently free. Uh, so they would be like, okay, so what are we getting different from the B2C? What, what, why, why would we pay for this? Oh, you can, you're getting a customized experience and we're going to label it for you and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, no. How much is it worth for the B2C? That way I can sell that. I'm, I can put a value on what I'm giving to my uh, clients or to my employees or to my um, insurance um, people, you know? So on, in our case, it wasn't until we launched the B2C that we could start selling to the B2B. And how do you balance the effort in between both is a completely different story. But uh, I, mean, I think ultimately it comes down to what's the path of least resistance for you, right? Yeah. I mean, if you've got a product that lends itself to be to be, then have at it, be aware of the long sales cycles and be aware. I mean, I think Emerson's done a great job of pointing out how important evidence is when you're trying to make your case. And I think it's really hard to go straight to be to be without some kind of evidence that this works. Unless, for example, you're copying and pasting something that you've seen in another market, in another country, some way of showing that it is of value to employees. Um, and so I think, and, and that's something your internal champion can often help you with, even if they can't make the decision for you, they can help you build your case. But in many cases, B to C is much easier because it comes with a, a much short, shorter sales cycle and it gives you the ammunition you need to get to a B to B relationship. That being said, um, I will credit this to um, Merdula, who's the CEO, CEO, I think, of Pepe, who did once say to me, um, you know, basically, there's B2B, B2C, and then there's employers, and then femtech employers are the only ones who have been shown to actually generate revenue. So I think it is, and, and that's largely fair, and I think that's really worth thinking about as you're building your business model. B2C may be the evidence on which you build your B2B model, but in the end, so far in femtech, most of the major winners um, from a revenue perspective, not a user numbers perspective, but from a revenue perspective, um, have been B2B, have been employer models. 
Um, I would like to add something uh, also from an investor cost perspective. So I think generally what you said is correct for certain um, technologies, like for example, consumer directed technologies, however, for more like medical devices or uh, mental health, for example, a B2B might be the easier path because um, you have to engage the key opinion leaders, the experts anyway first, or they need to use it first. And um, also they need to, to be the ones that educate the final consumer, the patient. So sometimes I think um, it's it makes sense the other way around as well. And then from an investor point of view, um, for us, it's really important that it makes sense. So the story and the go-to-market that you're planning makes sense. So exactly as you said, Nicole, um, you can have tractions with um, B2C first, and that shows um, a great investment for an investor. But um, sometimes the structure on how you plan to go to market can be the other way around because also you are allocating finances and resources and everything to a, to a strategy that follows. So um, so it's, it's to answer the question, I don't remember, sorry, the name who asked this question. Um, it's important for an investor to see that you have a strategy and that you understand that there are different marketing um, um, exercises needed, sales cycles, uh, presence. So it's unrealistic that you can do both at the same time with a small team because it's very different efforts. Cool. Yeah, that's super. Also, investor perspective is um, obviously always always very insightful. Um, I also wanted to talk about. So we talked about em employer models quite a bit. I think. It almost deserves its own webinar, just just that, like that zone in itself as well. Uh, especially considering Nicole, what you said that was super interesting. That in terms of monetization, it's been a route, like a path walked in femtech quite a bit. Um, but kind of moving from employers, maybe let's talk about like healthcare providers, clinics, um, being the channel. Sometimes being, you know, there is no way to to do B two C. You kind of have to do B two B two C. Uh, Diana, can I ask you to maybe uh, open that conversation up and maybe when it comes to positioning your product to healthcare providers, what are some key considerations from your point of view? Yeah, so um, as I already mentioned, um, sales and marketing are very different if you sell to customers or to healthcare providers. So for example, healthcare providers, doctors, the opinion leaders, they are um, there you need to, the marketing exercises would be informational like webinars, anything uh, digital, um, then also being um, publishing at in journals, publishing at conferences, having educational sessions at conferences. So being more scientific in the education and engagement, as well as being present at conferences and uh, having a booth, for example, or having a talk at conferences. So that's very important if you want to sell to um, to doctors and key opinion leaders. Um, then, as I already mentioned, um, if you want to then sell to customers, you need to have the opinion from these uh, key opinion leaders and they are okay. And they are then the ones who um, to champion your product for the customer. So it's, it's very different uh, exercises in both ways. I also think I would... I would say medical devices is a really broad field, and it. I think I think Diana had it right when she said it depends on your product. Um, so all of my work up to now has been on products where we sort of had to decide: are we selling to clinicians or are we selling directly to people? So for for those who don't know, Clue is a period tracking app, and um, while I was there, we released Clue Birth Control, which is a non-hormonal contraceptive. Right, it's a fertility awareness based method. And what was really interesting about that is we did have the option, right? Most people get their birth control through conversation with their doctor, but part of the value of the product that we were putting together was it could be sold directly to the consumer. And that's an example of, we were a regulated R, they still are, I'm no longer there, but they're a regulated medical device. Um, and part of the value that we pitched to investors was that we could sell directly to users via the app. Um, but Diana brings up a really good point, which is the opinion leaders, right? People trust their physicians to parse the data, to look through the evidence, to say whether or not something is safe. 
And so if your go-to-market involves a B2C option for especially something new hitting the market or something that's counterintuitive, um, like you know a fertility awareness-based method of birth control, you want to make sure, even if you're not selling to those folks, that you are persuading them of the safety and value of your product. Um, and the number one thing I would say if you fall into this category is doctors want to see evidence. They want to see your clinical trial. They want to see your FDA approval. They want to see that um, this works. And Diana mentioned they want to see it at conferences. They want to see it in publications. They want to see the data. And that's really critical, making sure that you're in regular conversation with those key opinion leaders, because those key opinion leaders set the um, tone for other doctors as well, right? Doctors aren't magicians. They don't all read all the clinical studies. They look for, you know, as with everything else, there are um, nodes and thought leaders um, who um, other physicians will turn to for a definitive opinion. And knowing who those people are in your industry is really, really critical, whether you're selling to clinicians or you're selling to um, consumers. I mean, obviously, if you're selling big surgical equipment, nobody's going to turn around and say, you know, what kind of, what brand of pacemaker are you putting in me? Can you, uh, can you tell me if it's Medtronic or Boston Scientific? Um, but, you know, the clinician, they're going to know what your data looks like. And so I think being really sharp on who your different stakeholders are, who your gatekeepers are, and what, what, what information they need to support you um, is, is really, really critical. Yeah, following up on, on what Nicole's saying, uh, she's saying that medical devices are, it's very broad, but then there's um, digital solutions or digital health that's also water and that's also different. In our case, um, again, to what Nicole said, you're gonna have to get data, you're gonna have to get to have data and show data, but it goes beyond that. In, in our case, they do not only want data, they want local data. Like it's, we have data on our clinical trials in Spain, but then when we go to the NHS in the UK, they say, oh, this looks promising, really good, but we wanna have a trial here in the in the UK, and because this this might be very local, it could be cultural, and maybe the app is used differently, and we want to see the data from here in the US. And then it, it makes sense; it makes a lot of sense. But but you have to have a focus on the data that supports the pitch that you're doing. In our case, with big health providers or insurance companies, we're pitching them. Listen, you're going to be it, it, they they want locked up from a cost efficiency, from saving cost point of view. So the point is, if you pay for a laptop for one month, you're going to be um, saving money because people are going to go less to the doctor. And this probably applies to many of you guys in the audience. So if you're saying that statement, you're going to have to prove with data where you have it, how you're doing that and how you can say that statement and how you're printed. But they probably, if that looks all good, they're going to be like, okay, but can we do some type of pilot or can we prove this data locally? Because we, I want UK data or Mexico data or whatever country they're trying to go into. So, yeah. Yeah, it's actually super well, interesting. Yeah, Diana, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I I'll... just, yeah, I just would like to add something because we are all agreeing so nicely that I would like to throw something different in as well. So I've also seen examples for ex um, an example in the IVF space. So which is of course um, highly privatized and where people are researching and um, they could actually put a lot of pressure with technologies on the clinicians. So a very informed um, couple that wants to have a baby, for example, can put pressure on treating clinicians and private um, hospitals or units to use certain AI algorithms or challenge them why they don't need certain, why they don't use certain technologies in their center. So I also think there is a different way. So we're moving into something where um, patients are getting more and more informed. And I, I think there is a discussion currently going on between um, like doctors and patients and should patients Google everything. But I mean, as you are all, also patients in some way or the other, we are Googling and we are informing ourselves. And I think there is a lot of pressure that can be and has to be performed by consumers to the key opinion leaders or the doctors. So I, I would also consider that in your approach. You're it's completely easy. right. Yeah, go ahead and go, sorry. I was gonna say, I actually, I, I, I don't disagree, but I would be extremely cautious with patient pressure. Um, I do think, um, uh, as Diana mentioned, the tension of who holds power 
in the room between the patient, the insurance company, the doctor, and the startup, people have a lot of trust in doctors. They don't have a lot of trust in tech. Um, and I think one won't, you just, this is my marketing hat on, uh, that might get you an individual sale, but like I think a, a really good example is Natural Cycles and the backlash that we saw there on the use of influencers and the use of social media to try and build um, what in many ways is a great product. Like I would use their product. Um, I, I have, I'm not raining on Natural Cycles, mm -hmm. but it's hard. It's a really delicate game to try and use public pressure um, and try to force change in a quite conservative industry. Um, as medicine is, right? Medicine's first job is to do no harm. It makes ado adoption slow. So I, I think you just want to be careful when using that tool. Yeah, you're, you're both right, but I, I see Diana's point. It does happen that um, in, in many other sectors, uh, forget about women's health, change is led by the consumer and empowering the consumer. And that, that does happen. Like I see situations where, um, it is the patient going to the doctor and like, I have heard about this medicine for my illness. What do you have to say? And then they wait for their answer and then they go to another doctor and they, they have the same question. I've heard about this medicine, what do you say? And then if the clinician, as to your point, they still have a lot of power, but that clinician or that health professional that it's not updated will probably fall behind. And then that pressure from the consumer really moves your product. Again, it takes time. You have to build a brand. You have to build a reputation. You have to have the research behind it. You have to have uh, use cases that are successful. It, it's not easy um, doing it and much more easier saying it. But I see Diana's point. It does help when going back to the employer space, when someone knows someone that their company is paying for that product, then they go to their company and be like, listen, this really works. I have a friend that works at that company. They're paying for this. Why don't you guys pay this for me? And that helps build a conversation from when somewhere else that decision maker receives the same insight, like, oh, I'm hearing this from uh, the employers and the employees. And then I'm also hearing this from, from uh, somewhere else. It helps speed up the conversation and, and making it happen. So yeah, I I, I I I do see the B two C helping the B two B in one in that's one of the ways the B two C helps the B two B. It's multi pronged. I think that's completely yeah. the answer. And and how much you lean on each of the different pieces has a lot to do with how controversial your product is, how new it is, how intuitive it is. Right, like you know, at Bea, we're making an at home artificial insemination kit. And it's pretty intuitive, right? How that works and why that works. We're not expecting a lot of pushback. Contraception, a really big difference, right? And I think um, to the to the comment in the um, in the chat um, uh, from Arsha, you need to have both things. You need to have the data and the evidence, and the clinicians need to know where to find you. But you also can can definitely empower the consumer to ask for the things that they want. There was actually just an um, article, I think, a couple of days ago by Andreessen Horowitz, <laughs> and we're talking about B to B to C, but apparently there's B to C, B to C to B. I'm going to drop it in here as like, I think it's kind of what we're discussing here, sort of coming as in bottom up. There was at some point a similar uh, vibe in, in SaaS and um, uh, selling software to, to enterprises instead of trying to sell it at the top, trying to get the end user to use it for free and then um, convince the the, the employer to buy it. I think the article in the in the chat, if you guys wanna wanna read it. Um, but I think also um, could be interesting to like uh, structure a little bit. So if we're talking about healthcare providers as, as your go to market channel, I guess we, we can then divide that into private and public, right? And then, cause there was a question in the chat about value proposition and like, what is the incentive for this potential you know buyer of your product to, 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 to go in, into business with you, right? So I guess what Enrique said with public, it's about cost saving, right? What about private? Like if you're targeting clinics, I know it, it, it's hard to maybe address this hypothetically. So we could maybe talk about specific areas um, like fertility or, um, or menopause. What, what is your value add to a healthcare, to a private uh, provider? And how do you, because there is a value add to the, to the woman at the end, but the buyer has different incentives. Um, how should founders think about that? Who wants to take that first? 
Nicole, you were nodding, so I'm going to call. I, I was going to say I've always got something to say, so but I want to give. I wanted to make sure I wasn't talking too much. Um, I actually think private is the easiest um, because they've got really clear incentives, and if you can find out what those incentives are and your business fits them, and you can help them with a problem, they've got the least to not not the least to lose, but but they're sort of the easiest. They've got few. They've got many fewer procedures that they have to go through. If you want to sell to the NHS, I think somebody mentioned trials and procedures and the right people, and you know, it's it's a little bit the difference between trying to like steer a huge ship and you know the huge cargo ship and change the direction versus you know a, a single clinic. You know, they're a speedboat. There's somebody at the top, and they can move and they can change. And if you've got something that's going to help them with better outcomes, going to help them with their efficiency, going to help them with a pain point like scheduling or software or staff morale or, you know, I mean, in many ways, a private clinic is, it, it's a business, right? I mean, it's run like a business. Can you help me with my pain point? Can you help me with something that's a problem for me? If so, we'll probably buy it, right? Because you can just make the financial argument. Or sometimes you can make the patient outcomes argument too, or some combination of the above, right? Clinics really care, especially fertility. You mentioned fertility, that's my area, right? So, you know, clinics really care about the outcomes they can publish. So if you can help them with their numbers, help more people get pregnant, help more people review them well, help them with, you know, with their own marketing, that's something you can sell as well. Um, or help them with their safety ratings, help, you know, whatever it is that you can fix for them. In many ways, that's the easiest sale because they're not that different than a small business. A large hospital chain, not that different from a large corporate. It's more that the language that you use, what you have to keep in mind is, in the end, there is that to C at the end, right? It's B to B, but it's B to B to C. So you can either help the business run more efficiently or better, or you can help them with their customer outcomes. But in many ways, that means you've got two lovers and that, that can be helpful. Yeah, if long cycles are if sales cycles are long in the B two B, in the private, imagine in the public. I think public is even longer, um, and it doesn't matter how much sense your story makes and how much data you have, it's it's super slow. We we were just uh, in conversations with the Catalan um, government here in in, in Spain. If we have 24% of all new births in Spain using the app, in Catalonia, it's over 40%. So we we have a case to make. It's like users, the, the C part of the B2B2C are already using this. Your um, primary care um, health professionals are already recommending the app. We are ready to work with you guys. Why don't we implement this somehow Let's to a small pilot, et cetera? And it's like, oh, well, you we would have to talk to the people on top who write the guidelines, and then we'll have to align with those. And then we are right, we are right now in the middle of the transformation, um, a digital transformation, and we have to have our CRM ready because we do see the value in working with startups. But then this has to be ready, and it's just it's not a no. It's a we really want to do this, but it's not going to be anywhere before two years. So I think okay, well, you call us when you're ready. It's, it's it's even even longer, I think, on the public space. But the private space, I think it's much easier. Even though it's long, it's much easier than in the public space. And we've talked to the NHS. You have to add the fragmentation in the NHS and something that works in one part of the country won't work in the other part of the country. And then they also want their own data. And, and like the NHS is, is probably the example of how it gets really complicated and slow in the public. Like it's, it's, it's a nightmare. Yeah, and I would like to add someone because also someone just asked in the chat what can speed up. So I think as you've all probably seen, we're moving towards uh, value based care so um, that we're moving away from uh, fee based services towards an outcome measured pricing. So an example, a really bad example, for, ex for example, is the um, in maternity care that um, it's just financially more interesting for a hospital as a cesarean section, even though for the women, it's, um, it's much more crucial. It's like an abdominal operation that can have um, hemorrhages and infections, but from a pricing point of view, it's much more lucrative for a hospital. 
So I think if you can position your um, technology also in that aspect to provide more value and reduce um, inefficiencies, I think that's a very good positioning as well. That's a good, so the, the whole, I, I'm gonna be completely honest. Every time I read an article about value-based healthcare, I, I feel like I walk out more confused than before I started reading it. Does anyone else have that? Um, like, can you maybe explain? Because I think I, I hear that so much. What does that like practically mean, Europe versus UK? And, and how much is that like a reality versus like an aspiration we're still moving towards? Well, it's, uh, I would say it is an aspiration, so it's not yet implemented and it's something that's discussed and it's something that still we are looking for many measurements and biomarkers that can define what is a good outcome in certain cases. But what I, what the example that I gave is that just uh, we are, we are used to pay um, drugs, for example, by or tests, they are prescribed but they are very often not um, that efficient and we, it's just paying more and it's not creating this, um, this uh, outcome that we want to see in patients. So what many companies are working on, including one of our portfolio companies at Apex, is that to create more, uh, better structures, how can um, drugs or how can uh, treatments generally or procedures be more aligned with uh, efficiencies in the hospital, for example, so reducing unnecessary tests or um, increasing outcome for the patients, as I mentioned in maternity, for example. Like we also know in maternity that um, uh, continuous monitoring um, or continuous um, support by midwives or in the birthing um, environment by doulas is increasing outcomes and um, it's the same for prevention. Like um, how, so the question in value-based care is how can we create models and technologies to increase that outcome while reducing inefficiencies? Thank you. Um, should we talk about insurance a little bit? We have a little bit under 10 minutes. Um, so insurance, so we talked about employers, healthcare providers, um, working with insurers. Um, Maybe Enrique, could I, could I pick you first? Because you have some experience with that. Um, um, yeah, what, with, with why insurance. is that an interesting route? And yeah, go for it. I mean, in our case, working with insurance makes sense because they have the ability to bring a lot of users at once to your platform, to your, to your, um, to your solution. So it's like that blog sign up, sign up, sign up that you're looking for. Um, they do have the big corporate viabilities. They, they're, they're usually slow. They're going to be going really slowly at how to implement things. You can have to have that IT readiness more than ever, et cetera, et cetera. But um, ultimately, you have a mission usually that wants to make an impact on improving healthcare outcomes on women in our case. And they're the ones that are in the right place at the right time. They're the one delivering the, the, the health solution and providing or looking out for those um, health outcomes. So it makes sense to work with them. We pitch them what I was telling you before, you're going to be saving money by uh, supporting this because people go less to the doctor, you're going to be spending less money, et cetera, et cetera. But before you get to the guy that understands um, that cost efficiency, that knows how much money they're spending on people going to the ER or how much money they're saving on people traveling to different doctors before they get to the real one, that's a completely different conversation. And despite that you're actually pushing towards that conversation, you have we are having to go through... Um, the marketing people and having to go through the people that see this as an opportunity to um, generate leads, to sell the insurance. And it's like all this process that we'll have to go through step by step. It is true that the more steps or, or, or um, the more steps you do in that direction, the stronger you are in the company, the more um, confidence that you create. And then eventually you are the ones they go to to deliver the, the solution and the implementation. So 
it's a long journey, but uh, eventually we believe it, it will pay off. And then one insurance company brings the rest. Um, once we've started working with the biggest health insurance provider in Spain, all of a sudden the rest have like, oh, you're doing this for them and can we talk and can you do this for us too? And how are you doing it? So if you sign one good one, usually that will help you bring in more. Like the really hard one is the first one. And then the other ones are not going to be easy. I'm not trying to say anything is easy in startup world, but they're most likely are going to be interested in having that those conversations to understand what the others are doing and how they can implement it in 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 their in their platform or their solution. Thank you. I like that. I mean, everything we mentioned, whichever like channel it is, it all comes down to identifying the business case and and getting into the mind of the, whether it's the insurance company or the private clinic or the employer, like what is the ROI for them? Um, Cause sometimes as founders, I think we can be so focused on the, the woman and the amazing benefits and the impact and all the great things. Um, but what is the actual business case that seems to be the thread across everything? Um, and once you nail that, it's much easier to, to, to play that game. Um, that's cool. Nicole, do you, did you have something else yeah. to add on insurance? No, not, not specifically on insurance, but I just want to say that speaks to two of the questions in the chat, right? One of if, you know, if you're in a B2B environment, what are the top things to do when you're putting your go-to-market strategy together? And if you've got multiple value propositions, how do you decide? Knowing your customer in B2B2C is just as important as in any other business. The complexity is you've got multiple customers. And I think what you're saying about knowing who your decision makers are and knowing what they need, right? Like be, being able to really speak to their needs that's what helps you determine your value proposition. And if you don't know what they need, then you should, then we need, then you need to spend more time talking to them, right? Because that's, that's the most critical thing for putting either your marketing or your go-to-market strategy together is a really clear understanding of your customer. And in B2B2C, you've got multiple customers and in government, I'm not going to try and come up with something clever, but like if you're working in government, you've got even more stakeholders. So doing a really good stakeholder map and knowing who you have to convince to make this a reality and how you do that, that clarity will really help you prioritize. That's awesome, thank you. Um, Diane, I also wanted, there was one question that I, I keep kind of saving to ask uh, from the chat. Um, so how do you position pre, a pre-revenue company to a VC given the long sales cycle? Yeah, I saw that question. If you wouldn't have asked, I would have raised my hand. <laughs> yeah, so it's the uh, first thing I want to say, for deep tech, it's normal that you don't make sales for very long. So it depends on what you are developing, what your technology does. Then um, secondly, um, can you do like, for example, we mentioned the B2C first and then B2B. Can you create any traction without revenue? That's important. So for us, it's important to see would people want to buy it? Is there willingness to buy your technology, your solution? Then if you really uh, need to sell to B2B and need to be um, need to sell enterprise and you need to go through the big cycle, can you potentially get a um, <clears throat> letter of intent? Can you um, negotiate with enterprises, for example, with pharma companies or any other big players that they are um, considering buying your technologies and to what, um, to what um, uh, criteria? So anything that um, you can get in touch with or which, which gives the, um, the traction, that is very um, useful. It's, it's about, an, um, at this stage, a very early uh, seed, pre-seed, it's about for VCs to understand, is there a market, is there a willingness? And that your um, pricing model it makes, makes sense, that it's reasonable. So that's my, um, my recommendation. And in terms of money, if you need money while you're doing that, depending on how your um, technology is, I mean, there are lots of companies who are the first year sponsored only by grants and public uh, funding. So it's, it's quite normal. But if you um, want to discuss more, just uh, send me an email and happy to, to go through. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we're going to start wrapping up. Any 
any um, last words of wisdom uh, from anyone? Any last uh, lessons? <laughs> any last pointers? B2, let me ask a question this way. B2B2C, is it a good idea in general? Is it something that founders, is it something you encourage? Yes. Strongly encourage. I mean, I, I already I already shared shared my bit of wisdom on this, but I think if you look at the big, biggest revenue earned in femtech, the companies mm. that were successful on a revenue basis, there is a clear trend towards B2B2C. I think one of the things about you know, really establishing a new market um, is you've got to convince people to pay for it. And I think, um, you know, sometimes it's easier to convince the consumer themselves. But sometimes it's easier if it's already paid for. And so um, I think, you know, B2B to see really helps close that gap and helps close the expertise gap, which is really critical. So for a lot of businesses, Thank that you. is absolutely the way to move forward. But I do think being flexible and understanding, um, you know, understanding how hard it's going to be and is this really the path of least resistance for you if you're a startup your first goal is traction and whichever whichever model is going to get you the traction first that's the one i would go with so those are my words of wisdom amazing yeah i would i would say uh it depends on, on what you're doing and uh sometimes it's customized not always the right um the right approach but it depends on your technologies but it's definitely something to consider yeah well, I'm definitely not going to speak about wisdom, but I'm going to appeal to the startup um, startup um, philosophy. Um, investors, other startups, uh, panelists, we usually reason by analogy. So we try and find what has worked before and tell you what has worked. But if you really, really want to disrupt, that's not how you're going to do it. Because So go your way. Go see what your gut tells you. If you think it's not because no one else has done it until now doesn't mean you don't have to do it so if you really think it's the opposite way just go for it um it, nobody really knows anything nobody the investors the, nobody really knows anything so just go for what your gut says i love that i think let's let, let's end with that nobody really knows anything <laughs> but it is just you know you kind of have to try things and um take in everything and whatever resonates with your way that's what you go for. At least we're, 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 we're trailblazing. We're creating new paths here. So I hope this was helpful. I, I learned quite a bit. Nicole, Diana, and Rick, thank you so, so much. Um, I feel like we, we scratched the surface quite a bit on this, I think, mammoth of a topic. So I really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having thank us. Thank you this for having us. Fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you so much. And thanks for the great questions. I think there yeah. is much room for follow-up webinars just looking at all the questions. <laughs> I know. I feel the same. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest Thank of your day. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.